So just a, a reminder, right, the introduction thing here. Uh, broadly speaking, we did mention that uh, we are working towards these broad objectives in this course, right? Beginning now, or perhaps beginning tomorrow, all the way up to uh, end of the semester, which is, well, end of the year, which is somewhere around October, right? So once we are done with this course, everybody in here, including myself, should be in a position to identify the different types of computer machines, right? Uh, be able to distinguish the various high-level components of the von Neumann architecture, right? Uh, incidentally, there's, there's only is it three, three broad components, right? Uh, which, is, which is really strange. Uh, we have a whole host of lectures centered around um, understanding the von Neumann architecture, and we're going to spend the vast majority of time looking at those three, three main components, you know, so the input-output um, uh, component, the memory unit, uh, and the central processing unit, right? But, but you soon discover that there's actually a lot that goes on behind the scenes because all these various uh, units actually have subcomponents within them, right? Also, we want to be able to, to see exactly how these components and subcomponents are actually organized internally. Yeah? Um, and then be able to explain the various trade-offs between the different computing machines. Uh, so, uh, incidentally, this is actually tied to um, a, a part that we'll potentially discuss in the next, what? I think two lecture, is it the lecture series after tomorrow's, where we start looking at the different classifications of computer systems, right? Um, the idea is for us to gain an appreciation that there's there's a whole host of categories of these, these sort of systems, uh, computer systems, and so we want to see um, when it is an advantageous for us to use, to use one over the others, right? Uh, so we'll look at embedded systems, microcomputers, supercomputers, and things of that nature, right? And then we also want to, to really get an in-depth understanding of how computers actually perform calculations, right? Uh, we, we, we start looking at this particular objective uh, when we cover the computer architecture part. It's, it's really exciting. I, I think I'm excited, really. Although I did this last year, but I'm, I'm excited. It's always exciting to discuss this. And then finally, we, we, we want to, to really understand exactly how data is represented by computers, right? Using bits and bytes. Um, fundamentally, we we'll discover that uh, all these things that we we, we see on the computer, the output, you know, images, textual content, uh, sound, well, we don't see sound, but we hear sound, um, videos, um, they're, they're encoded in a certain way by a computer for us to be able to see what, what sort of results the computer has actually computed for us, right? So we want to see exactly how this is, this is done. Right? So it's an exciting course. Um, I, I really encourage you to to try and understand this because incidentally there are certain courses that you're doing in second year especially and, and subsequent years that are going to assume that you've, you've actually learned this, right? So it's, it's not just us doing it for marks, but, but really uh, ensuring that we understand so that when the time comes for us to, to look at these other courses, um, it will be a lot easier for us to, to understand them. All right. Um, Right, so this is what we'll be studying, right? A com not, not this, but computer system, right? This is a, this is a, this is a computer right here. Uh, but, but the goal really is to understand how, how a computer operates. And so by, by definition, obviously, this, this device here, um, or this entity here, is nothing more than uh, a system that accepts input, um, performs some sort of computations and, and processing within itself and then presents whatever processing it's, it's done to us um, as output. And incidentally, right, so the, the representation of this output is not necessarily done to human beings. Um, there are certain computer systems that will present the output to other machines, to other computer systems, right? So it's, it's not necessarily that, um, I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of uh, a classic example of uh, a, a computer system that wouldn't necessarily present output to a human being. Any, any, any thoughts on what sort of computer systems this fall under? Right? You know how when you're using a device, right, you're interacting with a computer, the output is presented to you, but what we're saying is that 
we, we are trying to, to highlight the fact that it's not always the case that the output is presented to human beings, right? It can be presented to other entities, not necessarily human beings. Other computers, actually, right? Can we think of examples? No, yes. How old is Unza? I don't know. No, but uh, I was saying, <laughs> it's too quiet here. I was saying, doesn't matter. No. I was saying, what we're saying is, uh, it's, it's a computer system, essentially does three core things, right? Um, it accepts input, right? Oh, hey, hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It accepts, I know her, I think I know her. Uh, it accepts input, right? Processes the input and then presents what it has processed as output. Now, we're saying for the most part, the output that is presented is presented to human beings. But we're saying that there are certain unique cases increasingly, actually, it's becoming more common, where the output will not necessarily be presented to a human being, right? Can we think of examples? Oh, okay, it's coming in the quiz. Now, at some stage, we will also um, yeah, it is. Right. So you don't want to answer, right? It's not just about me here. Uh, right, so this is what we're doing. So, in the process, right? I mean, this is just an introduction. In the process, for us to really fully understand all of these things, we'll do a whole range of things, right? So we'll start off with, uh, and, and these things won't really be tackled in this order. I mean, so it might be the case that we'll change a few things here, but we'll start off tomorrow with uh, an introduction in the history of computer, computer, computer systems or computing, right? Um, we, we shall again redefine what a computer system is, um, and then we'll look at some, some major historical milestones that have been accomplished since, since the mid 1940s, well, since the, the mid 1940s, I suppose, until now. Although at some stage we'll, we'll briefly double back and look at certain gadgets that um, I guess could be classified as computing systems, but weren't really as sophisticated as uh, the things that came after the mid 1940s, right? Um, so we'll look at the, the evolution of computer systems, right? See exactly what, what sort of things have changed. And you notice that, that we'll place emphasis on things such as the size of the computer systems. Like I think the ENIAC was probably um, built, I'm not really sure, probably, this is probably first generation, probably in the late 1940s or something. I could be wrong, maybe early 1950s. Don't know, we'll figure this out eventually. But you notice that if you compare this with, uh, with some of the modern day computer systems like my mobile device here, there's a stark contrast in the size, right? Um, I can literally do so much using this computer system that I can literally hold in my hand, right? Um, if you were to compare the memory of the ENIAC and this, you'd be shocked, right? So we want to look at the evolution in terms of size, in terms of cost, right? Uh, bearing in mind that initially these devices were extremely expensive, right? Um, computer systems initially became more mainstream, I guess, beginning, I guess, the early 90s or something, one would argue, right? Before that, it was uncommon to, to have computer systems in your average household, right? And now, everybody has a mobile device, right? I do. I don't know who else. Right, so, we'll look at as we are discussing the evolution of computer systems, right, so size, things like cost, um, computational uh, uh, speed, things like power consumption, right? Um, uh, in the process, we we'll also look at the various generations, and they are clustered into four main generations. So there's the first generation, second, third, fourth, actually five, I think, and fifth generation. Right? So we'll look at, we'll discuss all of these things. And then after that, we'll, We'll, we'll look at the different classification of um, computer systems, the various categories that are there. Specifically, now if you go online, if you read up on certain books, um, they might have other categories aside from the ones we're going to focus on, but we're we are looking at the more traditional classifications. So we'll look at embedded systems, microcomputers, uh, which is your average machine. This is a microcomputer. Um, I, I have this device at home. It's, it's called a, it, it's called what? I've forgotten what Zesco calls it, but uh, we use it to, to recharge electricity, right? Turns out it's actually a computer system, right? It accepts input, it processes the input, and then it presents output using this 
um, LCT screen here. Right, so it's classed as, uh, it's, it's classed under embedded systems. Right, so look at um, mini computers, servers, and mainframes. Incidentally, these things are, they're almost dead, right? They're, they're, they're not, they're not um, as, as frequently used as they were back in the day, right, decades ago. You know, look at supercomputers as well, right? I'm told, so we have, uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, a post, a placard called Xamarin somewhere, Xamarin, yeah? Zamri, anyone? I think the offices are on is it the first floor or something here. Uh, they have uh, a cluster of what they call supercomputers that um, are accessible to all researchers that are performing like computationally intensive tasks, right? Um, these are usually large computers that are super fast. But anyway, yeah, if you Google up, actually, we'll discuss more uh, about supercomputers. But if you look up online, you notice that every year they um, there are people that provide benchmarks for the various computers to try and determine which is the fastest uh, supercomputer out there. Right? So we'll look at that as well. And then uh, as we are discussing all those things, we'll pay particular attention to um, the fundamental differences between these different classifications. Right? And then after that, we shall start looking at uh, computer software. I mean, we cannot discuss computer systems without discussing computer systems because effectively this thing is useless without the software that is here, right? It's dead, right? So we, we want to understand um, what, what this animal called computers, computer software, actually this was supposed to be computer software and computer system software. Uh, so we want to understand exactly how this works, how the interaction between computer software and computer hardware actually takes place, right? To be able to, to highlight the main differences between hardware and software, right? Uh, we'll spend a lot of time uh, uh, discussing the, the broad categories of uh, system software, right? After discussing application software, right? Um, specifically, we'll look at language translators, uh, operating system software, and utility software tools. Now, we. So the, there's certain things that we, we are sneaking into here because we know that they're going to be useful as we're discussing subsequent topics, right? For instance, when we're discussing language translators, we'll probably spend a little bit of time discussing uh, assemblers, right? Because we shall be programming an assembly language next year, right? It's not intensive programming just to get an appreciation of how the ISA architecture works, essentially, the implementation, which is MIPS. Um, Right, and I thought it would be nice uh, to have like a practical session where we, we don't really just zero down on one operating system, but um, I think we have a lot of time this year, so we will we'll probably have lab sessions dedicated to understanding how um, the Linux operating system works. We specifically use Ubuntu, like I said, 18.0.4, and then we'll also look at the Android OS just because everybody in here has an Android phone, uh, unless there's someone who is so rich that they uh, have an, uh, 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 what do they call it, is, is it a, what, what, what is that? Yeah, there we go. People with money, right? And then we'll also look at Windows as well, right? So we, we are looking at these different, we'll look at these like, like case studies, right? So that we see how they work and the fundamental differences between the different operating uh, system software. Interesting stuff. Last year, we only got a chance to play around with uh, Ubuntu, actually. And we didn't do a lot, to really, which was a shame. But... All right, and then we'll, we'll start looking at, uh, this, this is the, so the machine, machine structure, and we are, we are more interested in the von Neumann architecture, which is a basis, it's a model, actually, right? We're interested in the model, the computing model called the von Neumann architecture. It's a, it's a basis for most contemporary computer systems, right? So the the implementation of this machine is based on the von Neumann architecture, right? Things of that nature. All right, uh, so we'll look at, uh, like I said, the three high-level components that we'll narrow down on. Uh, this is still term one, by the way. Um, but as we are discussing each of these individual components, we'll also zero down into specifics, like so there are sub-components, like when you're talking about input-output unit, for instance, we'll discuss uh, peripheral devices, we'll discuss the, how the input-output subsystem actually gets to work, how it interacts with uh, the central processing unit, right? Um, and how it accomplishes that task. 
is quite nice. Incidentally, now I, wanted, I didn't want to mention this, but uh, you soon realize that we'll spend the entire year just looking at these three components, essentially. That's what we're doing. Right? This is what makes this course easy, in my opinion. Right? <clears throat> right, so uh, I guess once we get to the central uh, processing unit, we'll, we'll focus on the control unit, the arithmetic and logical unit, and the registers. Because we're doing this because um, the next topic is, is, is going to be centered around us understanding how the uh, instruction cycle, how the CPU cycle actually works, right? So when, when a program is running, uh, there are instructions that are associated with a program that are executed by the CPU. So we want to, again, an in-depth understanding of how that execution actually takes place, right? So we we'll spend time discussing uh, the cycle itself, so fetch, decode, and execute. Uh, please don't go out there and read and say, that guy told us uh, there, are four, there are four steps, but it's, it's three. It is three, actually, but we, we, we include the store, store instruction here just to emphasize the fact that uh, obviously you store this in the memory unit, right? My, and on that note, please don't quote me on anything, right? I, I don't like being quoted. Say, he said, she said. Uh, we've reached a stage, hopefully, where we, we know the importance of verifying facts. There's nothing subjective uh, in relation to what we're going to be doing here. Huh? So we want to make sure that we verify facts. Last year we had uh, certain individuals that would come, no, but they're not say this. You know, like, I'm, 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 I'm human too, right? It's not like I... I'm going to be accurate 100% of the time, you know. I'm bound to make mistakes, so one of the things you want to do is be on the lookout as you are reading. If you notice something if with the slides or what we've discussed in class, you point it out and we have a discussion. It's meant to be a discussion, it's a lecture, right? It's not me here preaching, like right? Father Tamba Tamba, which is, I just mean <laughs> Father Tamba Tamba. Right, so, and then, uh, and on the subjective and objective part here, uh, as part of homework, uh, I'd want us to go and look at Vision 2030, by the way. Uh, it would be nice to have a discussion, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. Vision 2030, it will come in the quiz. Uh, that's an incentive for you to... Vision 2030, and I want us to focus more on, uh, on the... Uh, I think somewhere, the, somewhere towards the end of that document. Anyone heard of Vision 2030? Has anyone heard of Vision 2030? Am I, am I not loud enough? Vision 2030. Zambia's Vision 2030. No one. You, huh? This is strange, right? I mean, there's there's always a goal in life, right? You know how uh, your <laughs> your goal is to graduate, right? After four years. Now Zambia has certain goals, right? There's a national development plan. There's a budget that is effective, and there's Vision 2030, right? Same by, by 2030, we want ABCD. You know it? Huh? You know it, right? That's no, nice. I mean, I, I think it's, it's nice for us to contextualize why we are doing this, right? There's a reason why this is being done. There's a reason why a lot of money is being directed towards funding people that are doing courses like the course you're doing, right? So I think it's important. I want us to specifically focus on, don't read the whole document, just uh, browse through things to do with the sector goals associated with information and communication technologies, right? Be nice to discuss that. Not that it has anything to do with computer architecture or computer systems and computer architecture, but we must talk about these things, right? We must not come here and say we are going to class just because we want to pass and proceed to second year. No. All right, so, and then we'll, we'll start looking at um, input-output devices, um, look at the different types or categories of input-output devices or peripherals, right? Specifically, we'll look at uh, input devices, output devices, uh, and hybrid devices, right? Different categories here. Input, output. There's also, what else is a network device, communication devices and whatnot, yeah. We'll discuss all of those. Um, and then afterwards, after we discuss the peripheral devices, we want to understand exactly how they are interfaced with, with your computer system, right? Uh, again, you notice that at this stage here, uh, sorry, I'll double back here. I don't know if people have picked this up. Beginning here, machine structure, instruction, uh, CPU instruction, execution, machine cycle, as they call it sometimes, 
we are, we'll be discussing what? This thing here, this component, right? Once we get to this stage here, we are discussing the input-output unit, right? Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll mostly focus on the different strategies that are used to uh, ensure that there's effective communication between these peripheral devices and the CPU, right? And look at the various characteristics associated with this subsystem, essentially. Right? And then afterwards, we will proceed and start looking at uh, memory, right? We'll, we'll spend a lot of time here because um, because of the nature of the topic, there's, there's, there's a number of things that we need to discuss, not just the memory characteristics, but we've clustered memory into primary memory or main memory and secondary, uh, secondary storage. So we'll start with main memory and look at the different types of main memory, right? RAM, ROM, uh, CPU cache, uh, virtual memory, um, you know, and registers as well. Uh, at this point, we probably have already discussed registers, but again, we'll revisit registers, right? and see exactly how, how this thing we call primary memory actually gets to work, right? Um, at this stage, I'm, I'm sure if you don't already know, you, you'll probably gain an understanding of why, why RAM, for instance, is more expensive than, than uh, sec a secondary storage device equivalent capacity like uh, a flash drive, for instance, a flash disk. I don't know if I'm making sense. But, uh, and then finally we get to secondary storage where we, we're not only going to look at the different types of secondary storage, so cloud storage, network storage, um, um, optical disks, like CDs. I don't know if people use CDs anymore, but hey, magnetic tapes and you know, flash memory and things of that nature. Uh, but once we, we reach this stage, it's not just a matter of us discussing these different classes of, of secondary storage, but, but we want to, to really appreciate the importance, right? Because eventually once you do the processing, sometimes you want to store what the computer has processed somewhere, right? Like if you're working on a Word document, for instance, you work on it, you save it, when you save it, and you switch off your, your machine, that file is going to be stored somewhere. It's stored in secondary storage. So we want to understand how that actually gets to work and, and, and also look at things like backup strategies that are used uh, because data is important. Fundamentally, um, in as much as we need computers, uh, but for the most part, we want to make sure that whatever it is we're working on is stored in a safe and secure location. Yeah. So look at that. Right, and so this would be like a topic number nine. Maybe we'll have an extra topic and whatnot, but a topic number nine would have been done with the, 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 the part of the cause we are calling computer systems, right? And this, this would probably be the end of term one content. And then we'll proceed to term two where we'll start looking at the computer architecture part, right? Um, so we'll look at uh, this broad, broad uh, concepts associated with computer architecture and specifically spend time to understand why abstraction is important, right? Uh, and on that note, I should mention that, uh, again, even though we are studying this thing, we are calling a computer, our, our discussion of this thing called a computer ends, it ends here, right? So if you followed through, what we are doing is when, uh, in our discussion, we are, we are, we've taken a top, is it a top-down approach? So we, we started here where we are, uh, you know, computer system in general, and then we look at computer software, right? And then we look at language translators, right? Compilers and assemblers and, and interpreters. We look at operating system software. Uh, the computer architecture part is mostly going to focus on the uh, instruction set architecture, the ISA. And we're specifically going to look at implementation of this model called MIPS architecture, right? Just because it's a lot easier for us to understand. Yeah. But we are not concerned with the circuit design thing, chip design, right? We just, uh, in fact, not even maybe to a certain extent CPU design. We are we're only going to go halfway here once we start looking at uh, logic gates. Right, just to see how these ones and zeros are interpreted. But I thought this was a nice way of us understanding what we are doing here. No, uh, if you want this, you probably want to make friends with people from engineering. You think they do a lot of this, right? Circuit design and chip design. All right. So once we start di dis discussing computer architecture here, we'll, uh, this was hard for most people, right? But hey, uh, I promise it will be easier for you. Successive generations are always smarter, right? Yeah. yeah? Like if you look at the trends, right? 
um, during, during my time when I, when I wrote my high school exams, grade 12 exams, uh, it was not common for people to get uh, five points, six points, and, but we know you're smart, right? So it would be faster for you to assimilate this, right? This, this is easy stuff for you, and millennials, right? You're smarter than us, yes. Yeah, we know this, it's true, right? Are we smarter than mom and dad? Yes, thank you. It's true. The, the only thing they have uh, against us is experience. No, it's true, you're smarter than Lighton, but Lighton is slightly ahead of you because of years. I have vast experience, and so coupled with that, so I'm slightly ahead of you, but you're smarter, right? More intelligent, more, not smart, sorry, more intelligent, not smart, smart decisions and intelligent decisions here. But so once we start looking at this instruction set architecture, we spend a lot of time here, right? We want to learn about, uh, you remember yesterday I mentioned the inter intermediate, intermediate uh, form of these instructions that is, is easily and understandable by human beings. I mentioned uh, assembly language. We shall learn how to write assembly language code, which is quite nice. Uh, simple stuff, mostly, for the most part, and we'll be using Qt Spim. So we'll start through by understanding the structure of um, such programs and how to use Qt Spim. There are a number of editors that you can use, by the way, um, or a number of tools that you can use to, to run your, your assembly language code. But I am biased towards Qt Spim, I suppose, because we have experience using, yes, last year, and, uh, you know, so. All right, and still on the instruction set architecture, we'll, 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 we'll try and see if we can understand the MIPS architecture, you know, what's so special about it, and the various instruction formats, right? Turns out there are only three, right? I format instructions, J format instructions, and who knows the other one? R format instruction, right? Um, and then we'll look at uh, the fundamental arithmetic operations that are performed, right? Um, a computer. You look at addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, look at the whole range of MIP system calls. We shall not look at the comprehensive set of the system calls that are available to MIPS, just because the focus of, of this course is not really to, to learn how to implement efficient assembly language programs. No, we are just touching on assembly language programming so that we understand how an instruction gets to be converted from one form to the other, right? From a form that we can understand, like you can understand something like uh, dollar sign zero or dollar sign the actual name zero, right? The computer does not know what this is, right? At some stage, these things here that you'll be seeing once you implement your assembly language programs have to be converted into a form that a computer understands. The infamous, or perhaps infamous ones and zeros, right? So uh, we are doing this so that when the time comes for us to understand exactly how um, the conversion takes place, we know, right, what is happening. You shall know to say, oh, the one is going to be converted into equivalent ones, ones and zeros, which is this, right? Mm, I don't know. Uh, but as we are learning about, you know, uh, writing assembly language programs, we'll narrow down on specific elements of programming, things like uh, looping constructs, uh, functions, or procedures, as they call them. Uh, uh, decision making, uh, I don't know if we can use the wage statements or borrow the wage statement here, right? So conditional statements, like if, if something happens, uh, how do you write an assembly language program that will ensure that uh, program code execution goes to a desired part of your code, right? Essentially, it's easy stuff. And then we shall look at number system. Now, now maybe the topics might not really be done in this particular order, could be the case actually that we'll start with number system before we start talking about some of these things because we noticed that some people actually struggled. We made the assumption that, uh, we made the assumption last time that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the watch, I don't know if there's someone who's supposed to be here, but we shall proceed anyway until they check us out. We made the assumption, right, that people learned how to, you remember base, base 10? Base two? Is that base two? Hmm, okay. What is the equivalent of in base two? What is ten? What is eight? I don't know. Um, it's not a quiz. It's coming in the quiz. No, it's not. <laughs> no, but but the assumption we made, right? We thought people understood, so we. 
we, we actually discussed this after we had already gone through these things here, and when we discovered that people were struggling with the conversions, you know, into hexadecimal. In fact, we're not looking at uh, all the fancy bases that are there, right? We're only concerned with uh, uh, decimal numbers, right? Binary numbers and hexadecimal. Binary because the computer understands binary format, right? Uh, decimal because human beings naturally we are we are indoctrinated to understand base 10, right? Hexadecimal because it's not always, as you're working with more complex structures, it's, it's not very intuitive for you to work with base 10. So you want to work with hexadecimal because it's the closest thing to base two, to binary. So it's a lot easier for you to understand what's going on, right? So we're going to just focus on those three things here. But in the process as we are doing that, once we start looking at binary representation, and again, uh, again, the vast majority of the calculations we're going to do will be centered around binary because we want to understand, because what? This is 35, because, surprise, surprise. Why are we focusing on binary? Because we want to understand how computers perform calculations and computers perform these calculations using binary format, right? So we'll look at the, the different uh, techniques that are used, sign magnitude, one's complement, two's complement, this is all term two content, by the way, all right? <clears throat> and, then, and then really spend time to see how text, the letter A, how is it, how does a computer interpret the letter A, for instance, or the number one? Computer doesn't know what one is, right? I will bet you that there's probably people that don't understand the number one, the one itself, right? Hmm. Yeah? Yes, Some, someone from, I guess, China who doesn't know English. I don't think they know one, do they? They have, their one is different, right? So anyway, but we'll, we'll look at how a computer gets to interpret the things that we understand as human beings into representation that it's able to work with, right? Um, again, we'll look at how images are represented by a computer. It's all of these things, images, sound, videos, they're perceived or interpreted by computers ones and a stream of ones and zeros. So we want to understand how this is done, yeah? Uh, we we'll look at video and color. Is dental? I mean, video is nothing more than images, right? It's just images presented to human beings in rapid succession. And you think it's a video, it's an image. Tons of images, sound representation. And then afterwards, we'll, we'll uh, now look at how uh, once the computer converts something like an A into uh, a character stream of, um, into a, a sequence of ones and zeros into a character stream, has life. We want to see exactly how that is executed by a computer, right? Which is why we need to, to discuss the data path and control, right? Uh, and again, the focus of attention here is going to be on the three instruction formats, so the I format, J format, and um, R format instructions, right? They take different paths and they, they actually make use of different subcomponents, so we'll spend time on this again. Exciting stuff, people, right? Really exciting stuff, interesting stuff. And then, remember when I said, uh, when I said, oh, we are not so much concerned about this other garbage, we'll briefly touch on the circuit design just because when talking about logic gets, you can't run away from that, right? Uh, this is the last topic where we, we get to, to learn, uh, did we learn Boolean algebra in, in school? What is, uh, yeah, you did. No, you didn't? Wow, that's sad. So we'll look at this and uh, under the software part of the syllabus, you mentioned that the last software tool we're going to use is Logism. We'll be construct, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we can, we'll learn how to construct basic circuits, right? Perhaps we'll also, perhaps we might have the chance to construct a half adder so that we see how a computer gets to add numbers, for instance, which would be nice. Hmm? Fun stuff. Uh, this is a dot here. And uh, don't say, you go on and say, that guy, he said uh, F was equal to A square B, there's no such thing, no. It's supposed to be a dot, but I guess when I converted to PDF, it's always that guy, right? <laughs> what, what do people say here? I don't know if you picked up, uh, no data, right? No, yeah, you're right, you're smarter than me, no data. But anyway, so um, in, in closing, like in terms of the introduction here, uh, my advice to you, really, uh, don't take this lightly, right? The, what we're going to do is a lot, um, for those of you that don't really have a solid background in computing, it might be slightly hard at first, but eventually you'll pick up. Um,
do not do what the people last year did. Don't concentrate solely on the slides, right? Read the things. At the end, each slide will have this, a bibliographic list of resources that you can visit. I don't put them there because it looks nice. I put them at the end so that you can reference those things. Um, if you have other resources, I encourage you to, no, you don't have to. I encourage you to go out there and research. The internet is free here. There's Edurome, right? There's no excuse. You have everything. I mean, information at the fingertips, right? So my, my advice to you is please attend all, all activities, lectures and tutorials and lab sessions. Very important. Sometimes you attend a lecture and perhaps you maybe pick out one thing or nothing at all, but it's fine, right? Uh, the important thing is maybe you've, you've learned something or it has taught you to say you need to go and spend more time on that particular topic, right? Please attend classes. I don't take, uh, uh, there's no attendance register for my courses. You can choose not to attend if you don't want to. I don't care, quite frankly speaking. Maybe I do care, I pay tax, so the government is paying you money to be here. Is tax being paid. Um, but what I'm trying to say is uh, you've reached a stage where you're old enough to figure out what is, what is right for you, right? What is important, what, what is not important, like you did today. You decided to say this was more important than, thank you very much, religious education and history, right? Um, also, this, please, every mark counts, right? When there's a quiz session, if I were you, I would write all the quizzes. If you think, oh, I'm not gonna attend the quiz because there's only one mark to that, big mistake, right? Make a difference between you passing or failing the course, between you getting an A or a B or a C. Please do that, right? Uh, and also, when we have discussions in the Moodle, please participate, right? Type away, write, write a comment, ask, even if you think it's, you might think it's a stupid comment or question, but you discover that, uh, are you busy? I'm not busy, we're spending the whole day today. Uh, I'm just joking. But, but you, you want to make sure that you are a part of all these things. The reason you want to get into the habit of doing these things is you want to get to a point where you develop some sort of routine, right? Eventually you will figure out to say, oh, what works best is if I allocate X number of hours every week to this course, right? Uh, I know some people last term formed study groups. If, if you are the type that benefits more from those sort of things, I highly encourage you to do that. Uh, and then uh, again, I will mention this again, right? I take this very seriously. The university takes this very seriously. If you are caught cheating, some character was caught cheating, reflection, some character was caught cheating in the exam. I checked out, right? They were told to leave. They're not going to be allowed to come back at Unza until after three years, right? No, I mean, one would argue there are plenty of places to go to, maybe you should go to some other institution, but why waste a year, right? And this person was in second year, actually, right? You'd, for you to move to a different institution, it means you need to start from first year, right? It's bad. Don't cheat, right? Cheating is bad. And I, uh, if you're caught cheating, it's, uh, cheating has, has a huge replication, implications, right? It's a... Uh, you're disadvantaging your colleagues, you're doing a bad thing. How many are Christians? Christians don't cheat. Are you Christian? What's your name? Yes. Naomi, are you Christian? Please don't cheat. Uh, yeah, but more importantly, right, I take this seriously. Uh, this time around there'll be no mercy, right? If you're caught cheating, you're, you're going to be taken direct to the, uh, you'll be reported so that there's a permanent record and a transcript and you'll be given a zero in the CA. What this means is, there's uh, zero chance of you passing the course, right? So anyway, are there any questions, uh, people, comments, suggestions? See you tomorrow, I guess. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, hi. I'm trying to say on this form. Do we, do we on, on what, this form? Does anyone have the form document? You don't. Yeah, but you got it yesterday. You want another one? What are you doing with this? You can, oh, oh. Yeah. Person. But yes, on which page, madam? Page. Okay. Yeah, the dollar. Yeah, this. So the thing is, uh, 
I should have mentioned here. So the tutors, there are two, two tutors assigned to this. We're going to break you up into maybe three or four groups, maybe two, I don't know. Um, and then you'll be meeting at specified times. So for practical sessions, this is more, this is more applicable to, to practical sessions. So in the, there's a hands-on thing that needs to be done, and most of this will be like term, term two or something. You will need to go to the lab to go and do this practice. This is our Dell lab. Hasn't yet been commissioned, but um, we are told by next week it should be open. So it would be nice if we have, uh, as one of the first lab sessions, how to, uh, once we do the Moodle training, how to access the different resources on our Moodle course site, right? And how to use the UNSA assigned emails. You have UNSA emails, right? Yes? You know, right? Yes. And how to gain access to all these wonderful resources that UNSA provides you by virtue of you having an user assigned email addresses. Yeah, but what is your, sorry, what was your question? My question is, what is the name of the lab? What? It's the name of the lab. The name of the lab is called, it's not like you're doing a distance learning course, that's what I mean. The name of the lab is the Odell Laboratory, right? It's the open distance uh, learning lab. It's just the name of the lab. Uh, alternatively, if there's no space, we'll probably go to the lab in the library basement as well. We normally have slots there. Are there any other questions? Yes? Um, there's a point where you go hard, then at the end you get to follow, and then you get to clear the wet at the end. Ah! The first, the first wet are very much falling off, then at the end you follow more, then again you go higher. Yeah, we need to work on that. I wonder if we can. We, that came up last last year, I guess, but I wish there was a mic here. We should buy, I work on that. The technique that I found effective is I would probably, sometimes I would walk and sit somewhere at the middle there so that everybody hears. I don't know, it's a character flaw, sadly. It's a, I have to unlearn that, right? And shout! <laughs> right, yeah? Moodle. Moodle is a learning, were you there yesterday? Yeah, you see now, you should have been there yesterday. Uh, right, Moodle is a, it's a learning, it's, it's an e-learning portal, it's a learning management um, system or software. It's, it's used to, uh, please if you need to rush somewhere, it's fine, class is over, I see someone. Usually you can walk out even at, when we arrive at nine, you can walk out at nine, 10, no one cares, I don't care. But. Moodle is a, it's, 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 a, it's an e-learning portal, so we use it to, most, some academics at UNSA use Moodle to administer their courses. So if there's an assignment, and a written, assi a written assignment, you'd be required to type it, and then instead of you printing it out like I did, um, you would submit it using Moodle. It's just a software, too. It's a web-based platform, essentially. There's supposed to be training. Uh, I had said training, if you look at the timetable, the timetable here, it said Moodle or somewhere, which is tomorrow. Scratch that, we have class tomorrow. We're supposed to have Moodle training, but the deputy librarian hasn't confirmed yet, so it's likely we'll have this next week, or perhaps maybe this week in the afternoons or something, but we'll, we'll let you know. So there's supposed to be training on how you are going to be using Moodle. So you, you know how, how to use Moodle and what Moodle is in your course. Are there any other questions? I think I'm it's a it's a it's a web page. So I'm saying for now because uh, so I said for now because nobody in here has access to no nobody but myself has access to Moodle. I have access to Moodle, uh, and we haven't created the class site yet. We haven't configured it yet. For now, all these notes that we're going to be having, I, I don't, we don't print out notes in this course, right? Uh, in fact, we shouldn't have done this. This is wrong, right? Uh, but everything is going to be here. So you just have to go here. You don't have to do that. You see this? You know how to use this, right? Yes, you do. Millennials. So you just have to go here, and then it will automatically take you there. Right? Use your smartphone to, to do that, right? Uh, it will take you there and then just go to the 2019 thing. It, will, it should be able to take you huh. here, right? So you have an updated, this document is here, it's up, updated regularly. It's going to be updated once we confirm the slots. And then, 
then yeah, handouts as well. Uh, so this slide here is in here, right? So I'm going to talk to the class reps. Hopefully the class reps will have, I don't know what technique you're going to use. I know the last, last group had a, a WhatsApp group or, or whatever where they communicated with each other. Uh, we need to come up with a plan on how we are going to, oh my gosh. I was hoping I could use Moodle for this, but. Okay, I'll talk to the class reps, and then tomorrow I'll briefly bring, um, I'll, I'll bring a layout to show the available times, alternative times and uh, venues so that we decide collectively when we are going to replace today's class, right? Because we are saying we can't today because of history and religious education. Let me just start. Yes. 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 But the, the the things that are going to change, tools that we're going to use that might be different, slightly more content, uh, but it's pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, with a few minor differences. What you want to do is, if you have a friend who has this document. You can just go and look at these, these things here on page two. You notice that there are some differences, but fundamentally it's the same content. <laughs> but the exam won't be the same on the test. But. All right, thank you very much. Uh, see you tomorrow at 12 hours promptly, right? Thank you. Anyone need this? No? We're done. Hi.